This is going to be a fairly quick video as it's basically an answer, if that's the right word to use, to a video made by X-Ray Tony, who I'm sure if you're watching my channel, you'll be familiar with this gentleman. He built an earlier version of this amplifier and made some very good comments about how to make it better and basically what was wrong with it, if anything. Now, this one is basically the same product, but it no longer has the awful loudness control buttons and switches and extra PCBs that Tony didn't like. And I agree with him 100% on that. I don't like the signal being messed about with particularly like that. But this amplifier seems to be the answer to it. It has literally a volume control and an on off switch. Now, before we go inside the amplifier and I'll show you some of the differences that I've made to it and the differences that actually exist. Now, this is one of the modifications that I've put on. Um, it's, it's hardly revolutionary, but it hasn't got an illuminated on button. Now, you could argue the valves glow and particularly the magic eyes light up. And this is very true. But now this is the little switch and it would be probably OK. But basically, I just didn't like it. I thought it looked, I don't know, just a bit tacky. Now, as you'll see when I turn this on presently, this actually has a LED inside the switch which is completely isolated from the mains and clearly you don't want to put an LED rated at a probably probably two volts or so across the mains so what I've done um, I've taken it from the 6.3 volt AC and as it draws such a low current there's no extra load or anything like that in fact I've got it set up at the moment to draw seven milliamps from the 6.3 volt AC supply. And I've actually fitted a 680 ohm resistor in series with that. So that that's where you get the seven milliamps current draw. And I've based that current draw purely on how illuminated I wanted the LED to look. I didn't want it to be to light up the whole room as some LEDs can. I just wanted it to show that it was on. Now, the other thing that I'm sure all you valve good buddies know, 6.3 volts is AC and the diode really wants DC. Now, you could put a diode in series with this, but I run it straight off AC because it is a diode after all, so it will provide its own rectification and there is no flicker. I'm going to take the cover off and show you inside and things I've changed and not changed. And then presently we'll take it into the other room and connect it to the Wharfdale E90s. And I will play you a piece of music, but as I've said to you, uh, probably every single video I've ever made, you will be hearing the loudspeaker and the crappy microphone on this thing. And it is crappy, it really is. Um, so don't judge the quality of it from there. All you'll hear is that it plays music and it sounds OK. And that's all you can expect from such a demonstration. So I'm the same as you. I do like to hear the amplifier or the speakers, knowing full well that I'm not really listening to those. I'm listening to the speaker on my whatever I'm playing it through. Anyway, that's enough waffle. Let's have a look inside. I don't really want to go over this in great detail because Tony's made a much better video than I will. He's more knowledgeable on this on valve amplifiers than me. So go and visit his video and it will give you all the details you need to go uh, need to know. Like Tony, I didn't like the original orientation of the transformers. When you buy the product, all the laminations are in line and same with the core. And 
I have no idea whether that will actually sound okay or whether that will induce hum and noise. But just going back to the theory of valve amp, or any amplifier for that matter, you never want the cores in the same orientation. Here the core is running this way, of course. This is the mains transformer. And here is the output transformer, one of the output transformers. So I've got the laminations going this way and that way, and the core going that way, and the core here going that way. You cannot help but make them very close because there's nowhere else to put them. So even this isn't good practice, but it does work. But as I said previously, I've got no justification in saying that the way they suggest you put it won't work and be noise free. But this is theoretically better. And it's as theoretically better as you can do on the limited space <laughs> with the transformer sizes that they are. One of the other things that is different on this from Tony's version is the output transformer. It's basically the same, but the low impedance side is on here. There are the tappings just, just out of sight. And on the other side is the high voltage or the anode or plate inputs. That's where you get a nasty shock and that's where you don't. I believe on Tony's one from memory, they were both on the same side. This in a way is slightly better because it gives you more versatility of keeping the secondary away from the primary. Right, I've undone the screws for the base and I'm going to take the cover off and take a look inside. This is the volume control board and it has a one of the lower qualities but it's still an Alps potentiometer under there and the signal literally comes in from the front panel and goes straight here and then it comes out here for the left and here for the right via these screened cables. Unfortunately most of the cables they supply are too long because they've actually supplied them for the original model. If you go online this came from Dork and if you pester them they will give you a link where you can download a very comprehensive layout and all the details. But sadly, it's not correct. I mean, it's correct enough that if you have a little bit of knowledge, you'll get this working. Because I built this prior to getting the details. So if you like, it's my layout and my idea of how it should be. So the wiring looms you won't find are the same as in the photographs. Here's the back of the switch with the LED in it. And these are the power cables here, especially if I point to the right area. And this twisted pair is where it picks up the 6.3 volts from the heater supply, which all these twisted pairs are all heater wiring. I want to show you this wire here. When I first put it all together, I couldn't believe how low a noise the amplifier was. In my experience of valve amplifiers, there's always a little bit of 50 or 100 cycle hum. Obviously that'll be 60 or 120 in the US and other countries like that. But this is absolutely silent. There is zero hiss that I can detect and zero hum. But initially I found that when you turned the volume control, when it was zero, there was zero hum. But as you turned it up, the hum got progressively louder. And I found the problem after a bit of experimenting and it's simply this. This is the input cable that runs along here into the input sockets. Now, that was originally, and it shows you this in the, in the circuit drawings, it runs along this area here. This other cable, by the way, which you, know, you can't quite see it, but that's another cable, that's the feedback loop, and that doesn't seem to be sensitive to hum 
because obviously you've got heater windings and all sorts of stuff going along there. So I ended up just lifting this cable and I've just dabbed a little bit of um, araldite in there to keep it in place, otherwise it will just flap about. And it's now probably the quietest amplifier of any type I've ever built, or even heard for that matter. You take it from me, if you wire it with that from the, there, Tony didn't say whether his one produced any hum at all, but I'm using Wharfdale E90s, which are 92, 93 dB sensitivity. And I can honestly say, as I'm not trying to sell you one of these, it is completely silent. There is no hiss at any position of the volume control and zero hum. One thing that I have done on here, which I only found out after I got the official drawings, you can see here, that's the trace of the HT wire, high tension wire, and the same on the other valves. And what they've suggested you do is to put a, a wire over there. I don't really know why, because the, the PCB, I suppose it is susceptible to high voltage, because you've got about 330, 340 from memory. Don't quote me on that. Lots of volts, and it hurts if you touch it, so not recommended. So I've just literally got some twisted wire, twisted it all together, and put a firm connection. And I've done that on all four of the output tubes. Now the power supply, which is largely this board, is over the top. I have to say, it really is. Such a circuit does not need a stabilised supply. It takes the, basically the HT straight off these four diodes here. There's two there and two there. And it's then smoothed by these caps. But then it goes through a circuit with Zena diodes and goodness knows what how this, this chip here. And I ask myself why? Because you honestly do not need a stabilised supply to run the screen grids and some of the other circuitry. You just simply don't, because it runs in class AB anyway, so that the current drawn is not going to change dramatically on load or offload. So it does seem a lot, you're paying a lot extra for this that may make it theoretically better, but in practice won't make any difference to the sound whatsoever. Now I have to say putting this together was a sheer joy. Other than the fact I had to drill extra holes for the transformer and uh, there was a, a degree of metalwork involved with the um, on off switch. Clearly the hole had to be bigger so I had to get my file out. These are basically the Chinese version of EL84s and it's a parallel push, it's not a parallel push pull at all. It's a push pull amplifier which according to my figures I get, and I haven't put any of these tests online because simply Tony's done it and his equipment's way better than mine, but I got about 12.8 watts per channel just prior to clipping into 8 ohms. This will also run 4 ohms by a click of the switch on the back panel. These are double triodes and obviously there's magic eyes. Now these do absolutely nothing to the sound at all. They are superfluous other than the fact they look really nice when they're running and there's an adjustment inside for setting up the sensitivity on it. And I've set it so that just prior to clipping um, they do touch the display touches. Here's a quick look at the back. Nothing much to say. Power in here, speaker, and that's your impedance selector and your input. Just before we go into the other room and I throw some vaults at it, I just wanted to tell you what I actually think of it. Now, I've not heard 
or built a valve amplifier for probably 40 years. And I appreciate that's probably longer than some of you good folks have lived. And in my youth, which was a long time ago, I'm 70 years old now, um, I used to play with things like this, this amplifier. And I've built all the Mallard 510s, 3.3s, and um, the, the 20 watt version with EL 34s. So I know what good amplifiers of their day sounds like. And of course, compared with the domestic stuff, these kind of amplifiers sounded infinitely superior. But are they going to sound superior compared with today's modern amplifiers? Let me tell you what my thoughts are about the amplifier. First of all, I've told you it gives just over 12 watts per channel. RMS, continuous, sine wave, all the, all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I have to say, I was absolutely amazed how loud it gets. Because the last amplifier I built is 120 watts per channel, which you, you've probably seen if you look at my stuff. Um, and that gets really loud. I mean, it really does. Um, but when you consider this is roughly 10, just over 10 watts, I can't tell you how loud it gets. It really does get loud. And when I think back to my youth, when I used to play with these amplifiers, when valves were pocket money, not telephone numbers like they are today, it really does get loud. Don't be put off if you're going to buy one of these and think 10 watts. It appears, and I can't give you any explanation for this, but it appears to be much more powerful than it really is. I still don't know why. Maybe it's because you can run it well into clip at three or 4% distortion. And it still doesn't sound that bad um, compared with a transistor amplifier where the moment it hits clipping, it sounds bloody horrible, doesn't it? Because it, it just, if you clip a valve, usually it just sort of smooths over rather than squares. Whereas a transistor amplifier, if you overdrive it, it produces quite wonderful square waves which are not terribly musical. So volume is no problem unless you've got very inefficient speakers. I think if you've got speakers of um, 89, 90 or more, you're gonna, it's going to get loud, no doubt about that. Now, when you listen to, let's say you take a reference recording direct to disc or direct to CD, which is high quality, it does lack detail. So imagine you've just got the best recording that you can buy, million bit or analog that's just direct to disc and high quality, cut at 45. You know the sort of stuff I mean. It lacks detail on such recordings. It really does. Um, and it also lacks punch and dynamic range. But you think, oh, well, he hates it. No, I don't, because most recordings aren't like that. Most recordings are crap. I mean, that's, I, I'm using that word, but they are. You listen to modern recordings, <coughs> excuse me, there's no dynamic range. It's just virtually clipping, if not clipping. And such recordings, <coughs> excuse me, sound harsh and horrible. But on a valve amplifier, and this is why I think many people like valve amplifiers, is because they smooth out the rough edges. And if you've got sort of clipping square waves, it smooths them out. And I've listened to some of my old recordings of 45s and stuff like that which I've never thought sounded terribly good. And going through this amplifier, it cleans them up. You're, in a way, you're using the deficiencies 
or an amplifier full of iron and transformers and stuff like that um, to make it sound better. Now, I'm convinced a good transistor amplifier, be it class D or class AB, overall sounds more accurate. If you're looking for an accuracy of sound, I don't think you will beat it with a valve amplifier. But if all your recordings, like most people, are mediocre and you've got one or two discs that really outshine, this will make a pretty good job of it. And I've listened to it now virtually every day, several hours, part just in the background and also sitting down, carefully listening to tracks that I've heard many times and on many different pieces of equipment. And I would sum up by saying, before we go and listen, we're going to do that. It makes most recordings sound good. But a very, very good recording, it makes it sound soft. So you pays your money and you takes the choice. I have to say, for me personally, I prefer accuracy of sound and not necessarily one that's pleasant. I, I just accept the fact that a crap recording will sound like a crap recording because no amplifier can make a bad recording sound better. It's, it's just impossible. You can't get out better than you put in. So I hope that makes it clear. And do go along to Tony's site and have a look at his review. It goes into it a lot more detail than I have. And it's just really another person's opinion on the way it is. But great fun to build, but I would suggest you need a little bit of knowledge to know how to put it together because the diagrams, you, you, you can't follow the diagrams because A, the color coded wires don't exist. So it's, it's a bit of a, you've got to be able to know where the circuit is and how it works and what to put near what. So if you, if you're no, if you have no experience of valve amplifiers or building amplifiers, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. But other than that, great fun. And I'm going to sell it now. Well, I'm going to try. Anyway, let's go and have a listen. <laughs> 